Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, how can you be a good friend to someone who is suicidal? And I'm in conversation with Joe Heyman, who is the Managing Director at the Holocaust Education Trust. But for the context of this conversation, Joe is here as my friend. Uh, my name's Joe Heyman and I've worked in charity and youth sector my whole career and you and I met when I was Chief Executive at the PSHE Association. Yeah, we're talking today because uh, you're my friend and the question is around how to be a good friend to someone who is suicidal and I'm quite, I am actually like quite yeah feeling all the feelings about this conversation. I think you wanted to start off by talking about yourself not being an expert and kind of putting this into a bit of context didn't you? Uh, I did, yeah, just because um, I think it's I think it's important. Uh, like I, I was glad when you asked to have the conversation, and I think it's a if challenging, important thing to be able to talk about. Uh, but when talking about it, I just I want to say three things. First is I'm not an expert, um, and certainly as we as we talk, will I think it will come out that I was just a lot of the time making it up as I was going along and um, I think that's all right but I think it's important to be open about that I think being open is really important that's the second thing I want to I just want to be as honest as I can be including about um, making mistakes and not knowing the right thing to do um, and my own fallibilities and yeah like all of the mistakes I would have made along the way Um, and then the third thing is I'm very happy to talk about things that I've done and hopefully that might be useful in some way uh, for someone, but uh, it's the person who's feeling suicidal, who's doing the hard work just to survive each day. Um, And being a good friend is an important thing, um, but the hard work's been done by the person who's just struggling to make it through the day. Why do you think I asked you to uh, talk to me about this rather than, you know, there's loads of people in my network who would be, a, you know, an expert, if you like, in this, but I asked you. Uh, well, maybe because you're looking for some, something slightly different and you've got lots of people who've got kind of clinical expertise and, um, and you've got loads of clinical expertise yourself as well. Um, uh, I guess there's a role for the other people in people's lives as well, not who are not the professionals, who are not the people who are actually going to go through the very sort of challenging and important clinical work that needs to be done, um, but can help and support the person who's going through that process. Maybe be the people who help get the peop- get the person who's struggling to the door of the therapist's office or the you know the support service or whatever it might be um and support them on the journey support them when they're wobbling um and i think that's a really really important role if even if it's not like the critical role which is the person who's got years and years and years of experience which i would never claim to to have or be able to replicate or anything like that at all um and i and i suspect as well that there's a bit of um the, the pro, like the professional and the kind of loving and supportive have to go hand in hand for there to be a way through for someone who is um you know at, at that stage at a stage where they're considering taking their own life thinking about taking their own life um i kind of feel like the the clinical support is how you survive but it's not why you survive um and i suspect and you know others can say better than me because I, I haven't been in that situation but part of the reason why you survive is love not because of a clinical process that you work through you the clinical process is one you work through in order to survive in order to love and be loved and all the things that make life worth living but you can probably answer that question better than well, better why than did me. i ask you i there's lots of different reasons um one i think is a a, a kind of a personal one that this is obviously you know it, it it will be a difficult conversation um and there's a lot that's gone on and 
I don't understand it from anyone's point of view except for mine and even that's quite muddled because I spent a lot of that time quite dissociated and so there's a kind of and in, I'm interested uh, to talk to you specifically about it because you were there in a way that I wasn't um, but in terms of why I want my network to hear from you is because I think actually what you've identified in terms of you know perhaps not knowing what always to do and sometimes getting it wrong and kind of muddling through that's exactly what i'd hope to empower some other people to do so i think people are really afraid of stepping up and being a friend when someone's suicidal and i think it's okay to not know all the answers before you give it a try i guess and, that, and that's what i think yeah i think it's important that people hear that yeah i guess I guess you probably like from from my point of view anyway you probably want to encourage people not to back away and to to kind of go forward um but also you probably want you probably then want to advise them to get some advice on how to do it the right way um so far as so far as is possible and you know I'm not sure that there are any necessarily sort of any always any right or wrong answers but there's probably some things you probably shouldn't do uh with people who are who are suicidal um uh but i think like i guess the attraction to me of doing something like this is to encourage people at least just not to back away and not yeah. to be too scared um and also that there are ways in which you can get help and support to be the person who's given the help and support as well yeah yeah, I think that's a really important thing to look at. The, I think starting though with that kind of, I always teach that if someone is distressed and generally I'm thinking about children and young people, but you know, where we see distress that um, the, the kind of the bravest and most important thing to do is to run towards it. And that's exactly what you're describing, but it's something that when it comes to suicide, people feel really uncomfortable doing. And the reason that you stood out as a friend is because you didn't run away and rather you did run towards that distress even though actually the point at which that started we weren't close friends like we became close friends through that process but we weren't and i wonder why you know and it's, it's something we've explored before but why was it that you you helped why did you step forward i had hundreds of people in my life and very few of them did offer help actually in a meaningful way at that time but you did uh you haven't you gone straight in with like the big questions haven't you yeah there's no warming me up or anything no. straight in there all right uh why well, i um i don't know well i mean i i care about people i care about you and i mean you're right that um we didn't know each other particularly well um at the stage where it became clear that you were in a lot of pain and things were very difficult um but like it was it was horrible to see you in that level of distress um and i think i felt like i could be useful um and i'm not sure that when we were kind of having the initial conversations, um, you remember like when we were in um, Hatfield and Wellington Garden City around, like around there at that oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I, I'm not sure I would have not envisaged quite how long and challenging a process it would have been, but I don't know, I saw you in distress. Yeah. And even in sort of initial conversations that we had about that, it seemed to be that uh, talking to me was useful in mm. some way. Um, and, you know, you want to be, you want to be useful. Um, and I care about you and like, I know situation, you, you know, you got a family. Um, and um, I could only imagine how distressing that whole situation must have been and I think that must have been like put a huge strain on obviously put a huge strain on you but a huge strain on the family um and kind of feel like if I can play some small part um then I think that would be a useful thing to do I guess I I'd like to be useful I'd like to mm -hmm. feel like I'm doing something positive um and like there's there's no entirely 
unselfish deed is there um and like i uh i'm sure i would have felt worse if i wasn't doing anything and if i was aware that you were in distress that someone was in distress and that i could have helped and that i didn't um and i also think on a very yeah like on a very sort of personal level um there's times in the past where i haven't been able to to help and seen people I really care about um, suffer and not being able not being able to do something and that's something I've carried with me for a long time so when I see someone who who is um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for who's like willing to let me in willing to take some support mm -hmm. um, and for whom I can be useful then I all right, do my best. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, Wellen, you just mentioned about Wellen, which I guess was a bit of a turning point in terms of my <laughs> descent into, oh wow, that was a, yeah. What's your memory of Wellen? So Wellen was a work trip, wasn't it? Um, you and yeah, my boss. Yeah, so we were having an all, all team sort of away, away night. So we, I think we went up after work, had the night, had dinner together, and uh and then we were doing you know strategy whatever the next day um and i don't know yeah i don't know exactly where i would like i didn't i don't keep a diary like i don't know exactly where that fits into everything else that was happening but i think that was one of the initial times where i, I felt that i got the sense that you were in extreme distress um and we sat on the bench by the station for quite mm. some time and uh i hope you don't mind me sort of mentioning this if okay, if, you, if you do then we can cuss it out later so it's fine yeah. um but i think we were all having dinner together that night and the idea of oh. having dinner together was something that was distressing, distressing for yeah. you um but, but I, I mean, I already knew that you struggled um, mm. around food, but this, it was clear that it was, mo it was more than that. Um, mm. And. But this was before the kind of the world had really picked up on that. I was struggling with my eating disorder again. I think it was hidden from me and I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Well, you, well, it, it might have been hidden from you, but it, it wasn't hidden from me that you <laughs> did not want to have dinner with 14 people that night. Um, and, and, then I, I, and, I, and I get that. But that, I mean, it was more than that. Mm. And you were obviously very distressed. And I think you, you talked earlier on about being... Uh, having limited memory of that time because of dissociation and everything else yeah. and it, that was one of the times where I wasn't sure I was always talking to you mm -hmm. or I felt again hope you don't mind me saying cuss it if we can mm -hmm. but like sometimes I was talking to your demons as opposed to talking to you yeah um, and yeah I was I was worried um, and there was a kind of there was a professional job that had to be done and yeah. I, you remember that we you know we did a lot of stuff about risk assessment and all of that all of that kind of thing like we did the hr yeah stuff. um but just like human to human mm. i was i was really worried about you um and i think in hindsight i was right to be worried <laughs> yeah my memory of wellen is was and, and and this is one of those where it's like is this an actual memory or have i planted it in my head it was like something from a film and there was some kind of epic storm and we sat in the rain and talked but i don't know if that was just my imagination oh there was a there was a storm yeah yeah for sure um but i don't think that we sat in the rain and 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 talked that yeah. I don't, or at least yeah. i i don't remember that um what I remember is that we traveled up yeah. and you didn't want to go to this place that we were um we were all sort of staying together you were worried about having dinner together uh, dinner with the group 
um, and as we talked, you opened up a bit more about what was kind of what was going on with you. Um, and then that evening, while some of our colleagues uh, sort of in, enjoyed the social element of it, um, and I think a couple of them did run out into the storm and enjoyed it, um, <laughs> you were quite, you were separate from the group. Mm. Um, you didn't want to have dinner with people, you were there, um, but you weren't there as well. You were present, mm. but not, like you were physically there, but not present, I think best way I'll put it um and it wasn't just me supporting you like other colleagues were really good uh, yeah. around that time as well uh, but certainly that was the time where I thought okay um she's got a lot going on that she's working through I think this we uh had um uh, our colleague Nick who is a trained Samaritan and I remember you encouraged me to uh talk to him actually didn't you as well and he was I did yeah i did and look, i mean partially uh and maybe we'll talk more about that talk more about it but partially partially that's because you know he's an incredible person and amazing and i would tr like i would trust him with anything um you know he's t he's one of the good guys um but partially there were 13 other people there and i was chief executive and i like yeah. had other responsibilities to manage as well um and I think that's maybe that's one of the things we'll come on to. Not like I think we're talking about friendship rather than work, but I think the sort of managing someone who's in a sort of desperate position yeah. while also fulfilling all of one's other responsibilities is a is a challenge to be sure. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and like everyone, everyone wanted to be supportive, and everyone could see that you were in uh, see that you're in distress, um, but. I think you're more receptive to some people than to, to others, and that's no disrespect to anyone else. It's just, um, like, I guess who you felt more, most comfortable talking to in that moment. And that's still true now, I think, isn't it? I, I yeah, I don't open up to lots of people. Um, and we talked about this. I was talking to you before about how I, I've now opened up to my friend Arthur, and um, yeah I'm quite open and honest about my kind of day-to-day -day struggles in terms of how I'm feeling and what's going on with my mental health but there's not many people that I talk to about the kind of stuff that underpins it in the past and those things are quite hard um yeah so how did you like how you know through this one of the things I I'm kind of interested about I guess is is thinking about it from your point of you and how did you look after you and and how did it kind of feel for you and and that sort of thing i guess um well i mean we talked about this before um so like after after you suggested this idea then i've been in touch about 10 times saying i want to <laughs> say this or i want to say that or this is what i've been thinking about um yeah it's really like it's it's really really hard um, and this is one of the bits that I don't think I, I got right was, um, sort of managing, managing myself. And I kind of think I'm, I'm someone who I sort of pick up a, a challenge and, um, and then just sort of charge along with it without necessarily always thinking about uh, whether I'm doing it the best way or whatever. I just, I just like head down sort of slightly blinkered tunnel vision. Um, and I mean, I think, I, th I think if it's all right to be blunt, in my head it was like, okay, we've got someone who's, whose life is at risk here. Uh, and therefore, um, if I can play a useful role in that, like I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Uh, and kind of whatever it, whatever it takes. Um, you, you did though didn't you I mean just from a practical point of view I've, I've been trying to think about this like you were just there like physically present either in person or on the phone like whenever I asked you to be there you somehow made that happen and you were running you know what I mean yeah yeah um I mean I, d I think I might have kind of like that can't actually have been true, right? Because I've got lots going on in 
in my life and I, like, I'm glad that you felt like that yeah. um but that like that that and I can't I can't remember and I can't remember a time where I was like I can't speak to you yeah. uh because I'm because I'm too busy but you know there would have been stuff going on in my life working professional personal whatever else um so uh you know I'm glad I I'm glad I created that that feeling and I think that that's I think just taking a step back I think like having the trust and the belief that someone is not gonna walk is not walking away from you is kind of there in spirit all the time i think yeah. probably makes you more uh as like sympathetic if there had been times which there must have been where i wasn't available um uh but no i mean like i think just before sort of going on to like the practicalities of it sorry i got a fly buzzing around me um like i think lots of people when they hear about anything about mental health or they hear about someone who's had a bereavement or going through a pay painful time they feel uncomfortable yeah and i like i i'm a huge believer in people like i like people i think people are generally good but they can get scared yeah. and i think i think grief scares people i think pain scares people um I think mental health, anything to do with mental health, scares people, and they don't want to say the wrong thing, and and maybe like it touches on something that's going on with inside of them, and so people can kind of go, can either sort of retreat or yeah. just not come forward in the way that they they could, um, and I'm sure that sometimes they regress it as well when they don't, but then they don't know what to do and. Um, maybe think that they might make it worse if they came forward but I mean I think there are also many amongst us who will not do that and will come forward and I think that is an amazing thing that I've seen for a lot of people who've had distressing things happen in their life is that sometimes the people who they thought and expected would be there aren't always there or aren't always there in like the same that same level but other people do step forward yeah. um and they for they form new and rich and important relationships as a result of that um and i think probably the biggest thing that i've done in supporting you is not on an individual occasion but creating that feeling that all right whatever you're going to say mm -hmm. i'm not backing away from you um, I'm not scared. I'm not judging. Yeah. Um, and therefore, yeah, like there must, there must have been times that I wasn't available. Like this thing went on. I don't even know how long it went yes. on for, but it went on for months, like months, yeah, like, I don't know, mm. like a long time. Um, and yeah. And I think, but I think you, I helped build a sense of confidence in you that I wasn't going to judge you I wasn't going to back away from you I wasn't uh like put off by what you were saying and let's be honest like this is dark stuff when you're talking about yeah. dark, when you're talking about suicide but I think I think some people are more capable more comfortable than others in those circumstances and like and that's fine but I think you felt comfortable so so now you remember that I was always there, but that, <laughs> that, like if we think about it, that can't be true. But I think the like the mistake, the mistake that I made was like, okay, so there's someone whose life is at risk. She's got a husband. She's got kids. Um, like she's got a family. She's got a huge amount to contribute, and it is, and it is a life. And I and I do think that like, life is the most precious thing in the in the world um and uh so so like then i'm just in full-on like okay whatever it takes whatever i can do kind of thing yeah. but um that doesn't that doesn't mean you should negate your own well-being um and i think i think that is something probably that i did mm -hmm. if i'm honest with myself and, and we've talked about this i think um there's been some like 
getting over it just from my point of view just kind of he like healing from yeah. that because it was like it was really hard and as i said at the start it's the person who's going through you know thinking about ending their own life they're the one who's really really struggling but it's not easy to be on the end of that on the end of the phone either um and i think just thinking back to um to that that kind of first time and enlisting nick like one of the things i could much one of the things which would have been smart for me to do would have been to try to enlist other people and i think there were times where there was a sense that there's a very very small number of people to whom you felt you could talk and that puts an extraordinary amount of pressure on those people yeah. and actually that's based on the kind of fallacy because as you're seeing now everyone to whom you talk about what's happened in the circumstances that you're in like the network that you've got every I, like every time you tag me in and on in on a tweet about anything you get all these amazing messages of love coming through from all these people some of whom you know some of whom you've never met right yeah um and it's it's great uh how many how many followers have you got on twitter now 30,000 maybe 30,000 right so okay. So there's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of people who want to hear what you have to say, who like appreciate your, your way, which is about talking about really challenging issues and talking about the clinical side and like the professional side. But I don't think you shy away from talking about your own experience either. Um, I don't know, that, but that is down to you again. So right. it well, is. Well, well, like, it's, it's it's down to you, right? Like, <laughs> I, like okay. I like I I can I can advise and support and encourage and cajole and all the rest of it. Like, you're the one who, a you've had the experience. I haven't. Um, and b like, it's very easy to sit here and say, "Oh, Pookie, you should do this or that or whatever." Like, if you're putting something out to thirty thousand people, that's nerve-wracking if you're writing a book that's nerve-wracking if you're doing a video or podcast or whatever like it's nerve-wracking um and so like i can help and encourage but i think you should take you should take pride in what you've what you've done i think but that like but, but oh, sorry no, I was just going to say, I mean, I just, I guess in terms of context, because a lot of people who would be uh, listening to this or watching this would only know the me that I present now. But of course, if we go back a few years to when we first got to know each other and when this all uh, kind of happened at that point in my life, although you know, I'd done a PhD in mental health and worked in the field, I never really talked about my living experience and I wasn't even acknowledging it in myself so the point at which you first picked up that things were really desperate I mean I remember vividly around that time um, going and delivering a talk to a room of 300 psychiatrists about the latest interventions in eating disorders and they were interested in what I had to say and they asked me to stay for lunch and I couldn't do that I just couldn't be around people eating and that was because the anorexia was taking grip again and I was it sounds so stupid now because it must have been so obvious if only I'd have looked but I was in complete denial about all of it and I never talked about any of it to anyone and um, so mental health was this thing I cared about it was a part of my past but I I didn't talk about my experience and you challenged me about that um and that's it I think we have different memories of this time but in my in my narrative it was a challenge from you, which was, you know, you, you have the potential to be a role model here and you can change the conversation if you are yeah. More authentic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think, I think I did, I think I did say that to you. Um, and I said that to you, um, both from a kind of like a moral point of view, but also quite a cynical point of view as well. Like just on the, like on the cynical thing. Um, I think, and you have since demonstrated that there is a big sort of space gap in the market, however you want to say it, for people who are able to address issues in relation to mental health, but do it in a relatable way, like not a dry clinical 
kind of way, but in a, in a human way. And I think um, people, like people are receptive to that. Um, and that's obviously working for you. And I know that you now get asked to go around the country. Um, I think you were saying that you, you also do stuff uh, abroad as well. Like people are interested in what you have to, to say. Um, so like cynically from like a commercial point of view, um, <laughs> You know, I think I was right about that. I think from a moral point of view, it wasn't just that I was encouraging you to live more authentically. I thought, I thought that you were doing the wrong thing, actually. I, I, I did, and I think I've said that to you before. Um, I thought that you were, you were not following your own advice. And if, you, if one doesn't follow one's own advice, then I don't think, I think if one is giving it, one should at yeah. least say, actually, and just to say, I find this particular piece of advice very hard to, very hard to follow um, myself. And I think uh, I didn't think that that was, I didn't think that that was right, um, and I didn't think it was right for you. But I also I was conscious even then that you have a following and amongst that following will be people who are grappling with exactly the issues that you're yeah. grappling with. And like one of the challenges I think I sort of posed to you is like, there might be a young woman who's 15 or 16 who is following you, reading your stuff, watching your podcast, uh, watching your film, your videos on YouTube, whatever, and seeing someone who's like this perfect person who's like, uh, just do it is like just sort of giving all of this advice like it's the easiest thing in the world to do and I know that you never you never did that I'm just like characterizing for effect um and actually I think there's far greater power um and far greater ability to help and support if people know the truth and the truth is that you're grappling with it and it's really weird that you Weird, weird, um, weird for me to hear you saying that you weren't open with it because it seemed to me quite obvious from when I met you mm. that there was a reason that you were interested in these issues and it came from a personal place and like I, I couldn't go deeper into that at that stage but that that was kind of that was fairly obvious to me but like I d I hope you, I hope you don't mind me saying that. I think I've said that to you you before. Like I I didn't think it was the right thing to to be doing, but like I entirely understand it. Um, but you know, like I was saying before, it's easy for me to to sit there and say you shouldn't do this. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to tell one person, let alone to tell hundreds, to tell thousands, like to tell to tell the world. And you you know you have got a big platform. Um, and that's really difficult so I admire you for having taken that step and being more open and I think I think that that is working for you and I think if I'd been smart um, I probably would have encouraged you to talk a bit more share share with a few more people earlier on because yeah. I ended up with a lot on my shoulders um, and that was really really hard and I think what this whole episode is, has proven, you know, we're talking back to events that happened five years ago now. Yeah. Um, what this event has proven, both in the, with the people who you've talked to, like in detail, um, and like had hearts to heart with or whatever else, and in your wider following, people have been ama like amazing and receptive, and it's not everyone, no. but there are loads and loads of good people out there. Um, like I say, I huge believer in people um and every time you put something out you get loads and loads of love back i think um so that that's definitely something that i should have done and i definitely shouldn't have kind of presumed in a sort of probably slightly sort of arrogant way that um i was the only one who would be able to to help because because i'm not i think just yeah and so just on that thing about becoming more um, uh, honest, just I think it's important to touch on it and then we'll 
moved back a step but um it was hard because of course at the time that we met then i had i was only just moving into actually working in in mental health and making that my career so you know you scooped me up when i'd been working in social media and i came and i was working with you and i was finding my own way and uh, very much a big question mark about could i um make this thing that was my passion and had been the focus of my studies could i turn it into my uh livelihood and i was having good you know there was there was kind of good early signs but of course it was even just a few years ago there was a lot less interest and there weren't role models in the you know there wasn't there wasn't someone i don't think at the time there was someone that you could point to who could was doing what we may you know now maybe i'm i'm doing now if that makes sense and i was terrified that because i was a mess i was a real mess and 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 i was terrified that you know i literally wrote the books on self harm and eating disorders and yet here i am like bleeding and starving and what kind of a you know how would that harm my credibility and i remember really grappling with that and really feeling deeply ashamed of where i was and feeling i should be able to manage this and therefore feeling i should hide um and pretend to be I, it, it's that, now that all seems yeah there's a lot to unpick there but anyway that was that was the the reluctance i guess i i, I felt i should be able to manage yeah and like and I get that, and I suspect there's lots of people, whether they're in the field of mental health or not, whether they're a parent or like a working or whatever, then they they feel like they should be able to manage, and that they want to be able to manage, and that they want to maintain a veneer for the for the world, because that's what yeah. the world's generally kind of looking for, and like, uh, and it's it's hard to to lower your guard, um, and I think particularly in the field that you're in. But I did feel strongly about that, um, and you know we, we talked we talked a lot over the years about um, sort of you know the like that West Wing story. So um, how does it go? There's a guy there's a guy in a hole, and people sort of throw down notes to him and. Um, like throw a bit of food down to him or whatever else and he's still stuck in the hole and then yeah his friend jumps in and says and the guy says now there's two of us in the hole and uh, the other guy says well i've been down here before and i know the way out and i think the reason i, I think that's important is that like you you can't I don't feel you can authentically meet people who are struggling while not being honest about your own struggles. Like that doesn't feel authentic, right, true. Um, and I think, I think the challenge that you'd sort of got to was that you, you were a role model, you are a role model, um, but you're also grappling with the stuff at the at the same at the same time um and that's a really really difficult place to be but i do think there is huge power in being able to say i've been there or i am still there or i'm a little further down the road than you are um and let's let's walk down together and i think that there is i don't know there's talked a lot about richness in relationships i think and i just i can't help thinking that your relationships with people will be richer will have been rich richer over the last five years as a result of having talked more openly about your experience yeah. than being and again like i'm just characterizing for effects but like ms perfect you know written all these books you know incredibly successful all the rest of it but like there's a, that wow your view of me is so different than my own <laughs> no but no 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 like i i'm not saying you're perfect what i'm saying is you <laughs> nice clarification I'm, I'm not saying you're perfect <laughs> i'm saying you presented as um and that presentation creates a gap between you and whoever you're presenting to and the very act of presenting is different from an authentic relationship and i think I think it's really incredibly difficult for you, but like, um, 
whether or whether or not you liked it or whether or not you you feel like you're a role model or felt like you're a role model five years ago you know in the office we had uh younger women who were you know eight or nine years younger than you were who would have looked to you whether you like it or not um and that's something that i like that i had to think about and think about how to manage you got a following you, you know you got fa family like all kinds of people will will look to you whether you whether you like it or not and i think um i think one of the great sort of acts of courage that you've shown is to drop that veneer to be honest to be honest about the struggle that you have that you've had and so you know the issues you're still dealing with to to do this um and to be able to put that out into the world and that will give huge confidence and like a feeling to people who who are out there and feel like they're on their own and who who's having these experiences and don't see them reflected anywhere else they'll see someone who is who has been through those feelings who is feeling those things that they're feeling who knows what it's like who's been in the hole and i would argue that you're 10 times the role model that you were five years ago as a result thank you i find that hard i find that you know imposter syndrome but did you did you were you always confident it was going to work out okay no no i wasn't because i think because you weren't always there like, like i i don't know I did, like for the, like for the audience. I don't know how people, how familiar people are with dissociation. It's not something I'm particularly familiar with, uh, or was particularly familiar with. But there were times where I was talking to you, and I was like, I don't know who I'm talking to. But it's not, it's not you, or it's at least not the you that I've got to know over the last six months, or a year, or whatever. You know, however long long it was. Um, and I think like a really interesting philo philosophical question of like who are we? like who are we because mm. it was it was you talking these words were coming out of your mouth the, the feelings that you were expressing yeah. were um you like you like were came from within you like they didn't i didn't feed them to you like mm. they came from within you but it was like talking to i don't know like almost like you've been occupied by you see the, you see this is why i say like i'm gonna get i'm gonna get things wrong but it's like it was like talking to your demons um and there were times where it's almost like like shouting pookie if you're in there you know say something that suggests to me that you are still in there but like like some of the times when i've talked to you I've talked to you and like it's a hundred percent you. Some of the times when I've talked to you, it's ninety-five percent you and five percent demons just occasionally sort of come through. And sometimes when I was talking to you and it was like ninety-five percent demons. Um, how do you manage that? With difficulty. Um, but like I think just keep trying to talk to you, if that makes sense. Um, because I think you the the very fact that you pick up you picked up the phone su suggests that they're like the you the bit of you that wants to survive yeah that wants to be a parent that wants to be this true role model that wants to be a wife be a mum you know be a family member be a friend all of that kind of stuff is still in there because because mm. you knew what you were going to get with me every time you pick up the phone right yeah I'm not going to be like oh yeah it doesn't matter you know yeah. you do what you want to do like you you knew what my agenda was my agenda was you're a parent and a wife and a family member and a friend and and you've got a huge amount to contribute to the world and life is incredibly precious and it is a gift um and when you pick up the phone to me i'm going to be doing everything i can to to save your life or to play my part in saving your life. So that 5% of you is still in there. Um, 
and even at five percent i think is really powerful and like there were things there were always things that i knew i could talk to and again this is where i don't know whether i was doing the right thing or not but you know you seem to have found it useful so I'll, i'm alive I'll so <laughs> yeah but you're alive you're alive because ultimately you're alive because you chose to to live and everyone that loads of people helped but you you made that choice right and like so i i'm glad to have played my part but you said you saved your own life you did um uh so i forgot what the question was now um well so i was trying i was trying to talk to you like the you rather than the demons and like yeah so there were there were there were things that i did to try to speak to you which i'm not sure would find their way into a mental health textbook and i think the thing that i would i would encourage anyone who's listening or watching this is like if i'm trying to encourage you not to back off from people who aren't doing well Mm -hmm. um but i'm not trying to say that the way that i did it was the right way yeah. um but i think i just tried to talk to you like the five percent of you which was the like the true you and i talked to you about your family um and i talked to you about being a role model and i think like I think I was right like I th and I think it has been borne out in the five years since that you have been able to carve this role for yourself uh, and this is this is what we talked about like two o'clock in the morning like in 2015 or whenever it was it's like you can you can get through tonight you can get help and support you can survive you can rebuild you can become this person who is a successful parent, a successful family member, a successful friend. And I mean, successful is not a good word, but yeah, a good parent, family member, um, person, but also that you can be a role model. And that one day, young people and young women in particular, I would imagine will come to you and be where you were, and you will be an inspiration to them and the support and you will help them on their journey um and i think on some level that appealed to you like that vision of a life where it wasn't every day wasn't so gut-wrenching um and having a good and happy life and caring about the people around you and making a difference in the world like i just tried to keep just keep hitting on that and also when the demons talking were talking telling them they're talking rubbish and like and challenging every single untruth that and there were quite they, a lot of them weren't they, <laughs> there were yeah there were a lot of them but like i mean i think that that's that's one of the that's one of the real challenges when one's mental health isn't right is that to some degree the mind starts to turn in on itself and there there are all kinds of um like falsehoods that are really really like pernicious damaging um uh, like uh, and once an idea is planted it you know it, it works its way around and gets deeply deeply embedded but i think part of my job was to was to try to challenge some of those um and then and then to try to to get you to a point where you were getting the professional help that you you needed so again like i don't want to give the impression that i think that i am a therapist or a mental health expert or anything like that at all I don't, I'm not, um, I, sometimes it's about just keeping your company, but sometimes it's about just kind of 
appealing you appealing to you to just keep going with the with the process um and that's what you know that's what that's what you did but no like the i i was mentally prepared for you not surviving as mentally prepared as one can be and i mean surely like isn't there part of you then that just wanted to walk away i mean this was a friendship that you put so much like you invested a lot of your well everything into that and you weren't getting a lot back i mean why would you carry on with that because it's a life isn't it like it's it's so like life is so precious and once it's gone it's gone you know like i mean you know that um my best friend died uh, a couple of years ago and he would have given anything to live anything like i could give him all the money in the world like like there's nothing he would have wanted but to live yeah. um he's got to like he had two kids as well like um and the idea of that you know them not having their father around you know it's like it's heartbreaking and heartbreaking to see that um and we, you know we've all known people who've who've died and who like died before their time and like it's a yeah like i say it's a life and i just i like i, I said to you before i love people i think people are so special and so precious um and uh look i i mean i've I think it, but it's not just your life, you know, the, the impact of you losing your life would have been um, very, very damaging for a large number of people, particularly the people who are kind of closest to you. Um, and I also believe that you could come through it. And the fact that you, you kept picking up the phone on some level showed me that there was a bit of you that, that wanted to come through it. Um, and that it, maybe sometimes it was 95% demons, but it was, it was never a hundred percent. Um, uh, and did I, did I want to walk, did I want to walk away? Yeah. Cause sometimes cause, I, cause it was really hard and like you weren't easy. Um, and it's a fairly sort of thankless task. And I remember it being a lot of that being during a particularly challenging time in my own life. Um, not anything like on the same scale like um, and that's you know that's hard but I go back to it's a life and you're a precious and special person and here we are five years later look at everything that you've done um, and I think you know it's definitely worth it and definitely the right thing to do and and I think you're just getting started um, and I think it can have a multiplier effect as well. And I think this is, this is what I ask of you. Like if, like, like if you feel I've given anything to you, what I ask of you is like, use it. Now, like you've got this amazing platform to help and support and change people's lives and break cycles um and to jump in a hole with people and walk with them and i don't mean like obviously i don't mean literally but i don't mean but i mean it may not be that you get you're in a position where you're supporting people one-to-one -one is what i mean like that might not be the path that you go down but through the act of telling your story um you know there's lots of people who who are in a similar boat or in a position like you were in five years or 10 years or you know however long ago um and i think that's that's an like an incredible opportunity that you've got and i feel really proud to have played a small part in in helping that um but like it's not for me to to tell you how to to live your life um and like it might it might be that at some stage you decide i don't want to do anything in relation to mental health or whatever else that's <laughs> absolutely fine but the other day you said to me that you were i think you said something like that you were feeling guilty or like that 
like all all the stuff that I, I kind of I that you'd asked of me or whatever else. And the one thing I don't want you to do <laughs> is to waste your time feeling guilty or spend time sort of turned inwards, like. But I put you through hell. Like that. That's the thing. I. I when I, I I guess I never I I never really necessarily stop and think about it very much because it was a really hard time and I was really you know really it was really difficult in lots of ways and there was you know feeling suicidal there was a lot of self harm anorexia was very challenging at various points of dissociation even just that was was difficult I remember when I was working at the PSHG Association I had to have the address programmed into my phone because sometimes I would suffer with dissociation and doing that same walk that I did every single day I would become completely lost in an entirely familiar place because my brain was so you know and and you were there all the time and you were there and not only were you just there and helping to keep me safe but you like ran towards that distress in like a really really big way like for me a kind of particular memories as of crying and crying and crying in the British Library with you when I finally I think I'd been to see Matt, my therapist, hadn't I? And had kind of, I finally, I don't know, something had shifted and I began to really talk about and connect with some feelings about some old trauma. And instead of just trying to comfort me or make me feel better, you actually did what I really needed at that time, which was to make a really safe space for me to explore it further and let it hurt more. And I don't know, but that can't, I mean, you know, we were sat in a busy place and, but you did that kind of thing a lot. You sat with me when I would eat when I hadn't eaten for a long time and that was really hard and you would, you know, I can't look at a McFlurry without thinking of you and crying over my, you know, like, like, it wasn't fun times, was it? <laughs> no, but like, there's, I mean, the thing is, it's fun times now. And I mean, I think that's the, that's the point, right? That you're, you're on a particular, particularly dark point but five years on, you know, you're you're doing really well. Like the family's doing well. You're showing more and more leadership to more and more people. Um, and no, I mean, like it's an investment. I was like, it was it was horrible. Like it was it was horrible. It was horrible for you. Um, it was still horrible for me though like obviously at like a hundred times less but i i didn't like it um it's exhausting like, like i say kind of thankless task um you like <laughs> spend i spend a lot of time on the phone and then like the next day like i felt like i got somewhere and it's like one step forward 18 steps back and like um but like it, it's it it's worth it right it's, it's worth it for your family your friends all of that all of that kind of stuff but also to be a role model to make a difference in the world um and i think th like there's been there's been a bit of kind of recovery from for me um and kind of getting myself back um to being in a position where, you know, maybe I'll be able to support someone else uh, in a similar way, not again, like not in a clinical way, and that's not for me to do. And also I wouldn't want to support anyone again where I was sort of thinking, well, look, I'm one of only one or two people or whatever can do it. Like, I don't think that's healthy or the right way to go, but to play my part, um, you know, I, I, I think I needed a little break afterwards um, and you know we talked about it and I think we probably had a bit of a break from one another um, and that obviously that doesn't mean I'm not on the end of the phone or you know don't care about you or whatever else but you know it's, like, it's just a difficult kind of experience um, but I just think God you know it's so so precious and and there's so much good to be to be done with it, and you know, like, and I, I think of Andy, you know, my friend who passed away, um, you know, what he would have given for life, 
and think about the people who you know like who's for whom like that pain's just been too overwhelming it's been too much um and the, you know and you can't be in a position to help i i think you were just you were just enough there um that um you know that i could be one part of helping you to turn that corner um but but like i think you did it and i th and it, like it's very nice the way you sort of the way you talk about us yeah. but but you did it because at the end of the day like i didn't have that churn inside me i didn't have that pain i don't have those demons like you you had to you had to live with that and it was terror like there were times where just being was terrifying and extremely extraordinarily excruciatingly painful for you um and i think you should be really proud to have survived that um and i think like you did that i think because of your family and because of the people you can help and support and that was an extraordinary act of love on your part um so i think you should feel good about that thank you you know i talk about you all the time like this is one of the other okay. reasons i wanted to um ask you to come and talk about this because I, I i i think it is really important that people understand that they there is a lot that they can do to help and that there is a really important role there for for friendship and also i do talk about you as a boss as well you were a really brilliant um boss um at that time yeah well uh, thanks i mean like so I, I, I don't know whether i was or was or whether i was doing to like doing too much and like like i get i get nervous about you sort of talking about what i like talking about me the whole time because i like because i genuinely don't know what whether yeah. i do, what i was doing was the right thing or or not um i mean this this story does have a does have a happy ending so that that's <laughs> yeah you know, that's that's good um i don't know whether it was the right thing or not and like and i think the textbook would almost certainly say that you should detach the professional support from the personal support and all of that kind of stuff. But sometimes like, like I kind of feel like if I saw someone's house on fire and there was someone stuck in the house, I'd want to go into the house and I wouldn't really think too much about mm. what the sort of guy, like what the guidelines were and what the sort of professional boundaries are and all of that kind of stuff. I think, I think we're human beings first, I guess, is what I would like to say. And I would, whatever I do sort of professionally in my life, I don't want to lose my humanity. Yeah. Um, and I would rather be a decent human being than be like a detached professional. Um, and that seems to have sort of worked through my career, but I'm sure that there's plenty of people who would say that that's not the right way to go and who would watch this conversation and think, mm, don't think he did that, did that quite right. Um, but, and, and I know that I didn't do it right. And I know that lots of mistakes I made along the way. And I know that there were times where I got frustrated and irritated and my, my feelings took over, um, which was, which was wrong. Um, but I'm proud that I didn't, back away and I think that that's the like that's the single biggest thing that I'd want anyone who is listening or watching or thinking about it just to say it's like even if you can't get the words right even if you don't know how to do it just saying like I don't know what the right thing to do is yeah. but I'm I'm here and I I'm I'm not scared of what you're saying I'm not judging you for what you're saying i am with you um i think that opens up all kinds of different different avenues um for strong relationship for people to feel like they're loved and that's not that's that's not the whole of it like professional clinical support 
is crucial but just that love that love might be a bit of a turning point to get someone to go to therapy or to go to like one of the you know one of the, like that center that we took you to at that Matry, state yeah. Matry, yeah which is like an amazing place and they do like they've done amazing things and like um i've supported people to go there a couple of times and i, I think that's a fantastic place and they do the hard work but just getting someone to the front door like you could i think it's not unreasonable that friends and family members couldn't couldn't help people who are really struggling just to get to the front door yeah so it's um, a suicide respite uh, center where you go and stay for a few days and, and actually getting me to the front door was tough wasn't it i think that was at a point when i hadn't left the house for weeks um i was very very scared of the whole world and in a really dark place which is why i needed to go there but yeah yeah, yeah. um so like i i wouldn't I think yeah I think maybe that's why I've been worried about this is like I don't want to give you the sense um that it's the job of the friend to like fix like it's not first it's the job of the person who's struggling and as I've said to you throughout this and always ultimately the hard work's with you but that hard work should take place in a professional context yeah. but like the the support and love around that professional context and getting people to the front door. Yeah. I think that is something, I don't think that is beyond most people. Um, and I think even just on a practical level though, I mean, you were always very encouraging of me um, in terms of actually attending my therapy and leaning into it as well, because I think it's one thing to turn up and another thing to like really show up and you encouraged me with that. But you've also just, uh, not just you, obviously, uh, Tom, my husband, helped with this too. But it was very difficult for me to work through the really hard stuff in therapy. And I wasn't safe afterwards always. And actually, I knew that you were there or Tom was there if I needed it afterwards. And you would sometimes physically be there or you'd be on the phone or you'd help me plan. Um, so that, you know, and even just on a practical level, actually, that that's very, very helpful. Yeah. And look, I mean... The, like as I recall you're taking some of that support in central London and like it was pretty straightforward to come and to come and meet you and like put you on a train or you know sort of get you on your way home and know that those are kind of risky risky moments for you and like vulnerable moments um I just to say that I think uh, there was a lot more hard work that um Tom needed to to do and frankly you know much higher stakes for him as well um and I, he's he's one of the nicest people i've ever met i've, all, I've always liked him a great great deal he's a good man um and that would have been like that would have been really really hard for him um because yeah. like because everything is kind of bound up in that um but maybe like sometimes with a friend there's the space to like i don't know um say say things where it's not quite as high stakes and not quite as important if like if the person did you know if the friend did say oh well that's a terrible thing to say you shouldn't share that with anyone else like, it's, and obviously I never did that and people won't do that but I can understand when you've kept things inside for a long time you're nervous about sharing them so having someone you can share with I think is a is a good thing even if they're not like the central um, person in your in your life um so i think i like i like the idea of team and i think i played my part i think uh i i we've we talked about matt i've never met him but he sounds to me like a very very good professional like at the top of his profession and i think you got the right person there um and you like you made a good choice for your husband as well he's, like, he's a great guy and i know that you've got loads of other friends and family around and like everyone plays their part in their t in the team um uh, and i think i i'm proud to have played my part but also it's the team around the person and the person is the one who's doing the really really hard work um and that's you yeah well, well, I think the the thing you, you've kind of mentioned a couple of times that really stuck with me and that I still think of now, um, because it's not like 
you know so it has a happy ending but this is very much you know it's not where it was but it's still I work hard all the time uh, to stay well and um but the thing you taught me was choose love and I remember you saying that and um yeah everything's a choice all the time and choose love um was is, is something that's kept me safe on more than one occasion um and I think the other thing is you know you have talked about being a, a, a little worried about people you know you might not have always done the right thing but I think that what you you always did um and I wouldn't I don't I don't I, I think you know I I'm here and I'm incredibly grateful to you and I, I can't remember enough of the detail to be honest to kind of pick it apart and analyze it but I was you know I am incredibly grateful to you but the thing that you brought above all else was that you were human in every situation so there were many times I know there are times where actually you know there were events um but there were many 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 other times when I had a very clear plan when I reflect on various parts of my journey when I'm amazed that I made it through the day because I would have put myself at such high risk if I was assessing myself now um, and yet there was something you know a connection a conversation something that was said um, that just brought me back into being with people and sometimes that was you sometimes it's someone else but it you know many times it was you so thank you I'm sorry I, I didn't come up with the choose love thing myself that's uh, one of many of my bits of fortune cookie wisdom that I borrow off others, um, other brands. Um, I, I love that cheese love store, by the way. Like this, they got such good, they got such good stuff in there. Um, but yeah, like you, yeah, that's the, like w wisdom is often sort of borrowed rather than stuff you come up with direct. The only, the only other thing I think it's worth sort of mentioning is like you said you know things aren't as they were and it has been very painful but we also we always talked about that japanese pottery didn't we like it was they call it kinsuri or something uh, yeah. yeah where the pottery breaks and then they use this lovely sort of golden glue stuff to put it back together and that it is as a result the the sort of the fixed version of the pottery is more beautiful than it was when it started and it is different and you can see the lines where it's been broken mm. um but it is it is be, it, like it is absolutely beautiful that that pottery and i think it it is a, a an amazing way to to kind of see the world like the the like you can't just push the pain away and you can't fix everything that's going to happen in the past. But I think what you've shown is that you can build a really, really good life and a rich life. And I think it's getting richer all the time. And like it, this conversation, you're being open, like being continued, to, you'll continue to be open with people who are telling me um, about sort of speaking really open, openly to someone the other day. Like, and the more that you do that, the more that richness and that, that sort of beauty of life will come through and that you will find people who've had common experiences, not, uh, not the same experience, but have had painful experiences. And yeah, you're, there will be a sort of new and different type of beauty in the world. But I do think it will be more authentic, is more authentic and less like presentational um, than that than it has been and I think that that's that's worth it. like it's all worth it um and I hope that you would agree with that yeah I'm glad to be here good yeah and thank you what, what do you have any closing thoughts this is where you say something really deep and meaningful didn't I say anything deep and meaningful already <laughs> So the, 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 the last the last hour is just like just rubbish. <laughs> no you said a lot of deep and meaningful stuff but you know i'm a psychologist primacy and recency effect people always remember the last thing that you said so what's the thing you want to leave in people's minds as we close this quite tricky conversation um i don't know like when uh so, so yesterday, before we did this, you uh, tweeted that we were going to do it. And uh, as you always do when you tweet, like you got 
loads of likes and retweets and all the rest of it but you also got people replying and you know because you'd uh asked me in i like saw all the replies and um there were people who were saying i wish i'd seen i wish i'd seen the signs um how do you sort of protect yourself like like lots of lots of kind of difficulty and unknown and challenge around confronting this issue um and all i would say is that you're like as a friend or a supporter or whatever else you're not a clinician it's not your job to to fix it you can't fix it um ultimately only the person can fix it with support from really really skilled professionals like that's the only way to really really sort of fix it and as we discussed before it's not fixing so much as kind of getting into a new normal and surviving and like life life will never be perfect but i think with love you can help people turn the corner and love means not backing away and you'll find your own way to do it um and it might be that you you need to ask a question like i want to be here to support you i want to love you tell me how i can help and it may be that you just need to follow instructions but if you can if you can find it within yourself not to back away that very act will mean so much i would imagine to the other person to so try Let's try.